I, I put that in there just in case Shelly was watching. I don't know if she is or not, but uh, I didn't hear her scream, so she probably isn't. Uh, hey, welcome to Aaron Live. It's the last second live stream. I haven't done one of these in a long, long while, um, but I've got work to do. It's got to get done, and I thought, why not just do it live, right? It's better than uh, doing it by yourself. So unless, of course, I make a huge mistake, then I look like a fool on a live stream, but those are the chances you take. Look at this, man. I'm multi-representing at the Portland Trailblazers basketball shirt on, the uh, Nebraska football shirt on, the uh, Newsy hat on. I don't know if that really goes, but there you have it. Oh, let's take a second and see who's here, shall we? Aaron Louvier is here. Leg Kick is here because Leg Kick is almost always here. Mm, just ate dinner. Excuse me. Uh, Dr. Masks, Retro Elixir. Hey, Andy, I only say that because I called Andy Aaron this morning on his stream. <laughs> but he appreciated that, huh? Um, let's see. Black Rose Comics is here. Uh, Praetor 7. And Marcus Killigrew. How about that? So we have a few people here. And probably a few uh, that aren't commenting because they just don't want to get involved in this mess. And I don't blame them. All right, so what am I doing? Um, I've got really close to finishing up, excuse me, finishing up um, <clears throat> this rights and piece that I'm doing for the rights and tribute book, which I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that is going to be a Kickstarter project that's going live in just a couple of weeks. Um, I believe their goal was to have all the artwork done before they uh, went live with the uh, crowdfunding thing. And uh, they have just a ton of really good artists, Tony Harris, uh, um, Jeff Johnson. Um, Tony Harris's painting, by the way, is if you haven't seen it, he posted it on his Facebook page. I don't know if he has a Twitter or anything, but it's brilliant. And um, uh, Kelly Jones, um, uh, Kyle Holtz, um I know, I think Andy Smith is actually doing a piece for it, which you don't really think of Andy as a horror artist, but uh, so that'll be interesting to see what he comes up with. Um, I don't know all who's doing it, but there's a lot of really good people working on it. And I was originally asked to do it like in November of last year. And I just was, because I was really sweating finishing Wraith of God on time. And I didn't want to take on a project like that. And, like that wouldn't, you know, and, and they wanted it by December. And I was like, dude, there's just no way I can do that. Well, I saw these illustrations keep trickling in for it online. And I was like, well, wait a minute. They must have extended the deadline. So I was like, this is, it started bugging me. I was like, if I don't contribute to this book, I'm going to be really ticked when it comes out and I'm not in it. So I contacted the guy and he said, yeah, we got a couple of weeks yet. And so I said, all right, I'll do a piece. So uh, I've been working on this, doing my Wraith page during the day and into the evening and then at night working on the rights and piece, which maybe is appropriate to work on a, a monster or a horror piece at night. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. And I finally got it uh, all penciled and I'm uh, got a majority of it inked right now. We're going to talk about some of the technique that I used to do what I did. And then you can watch me either make it look more brilliant or screw it up live. So that'll be fun. Um, <clears throat> John Smith is here. Uh, commenting on the multitask on my sports attire. That's right. I got a lot of my bases covered. Pardon the sports analogy. Uh, well, look at that. Leg kick says your work on that piece, I think will be the standout. Well, I don't know about that, but thank you very much. Like I appreciate it. Julie Pascal is here. Hail hey, chat. How about that? Matthew Lawrence is here. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Matthew. Uh, Epoch 252 says, hi all. Uh, Twirly Wharf. Well, let me try that again. Twirly Wolf, I'll be back because of you, not for Nakatomi. I don't know what that means, but thank you. Um, and let's see, who else? Da -da -da. Citizen Ronin's here, and uh, Omer Glitch is here. Matthew is, is uh, pouring out a little bit of love for the sweet hats, so thank you. Um, all right, guys, I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat while I'm doing this, but I can't guarantee anything, so... Um, since I'm going to be looking this way and the screen's over here. So, but I will check back occasionally as we go through this. All right. So let's switch cameras, take a look at uh, what I've got and what we're doing. And by what we're doing, I mean what I'm doing, but you're sharing, you're a part of it. So let's, um, 
Let's see if I'm a little bit more organized than I normally am on one of these last second things. A Collector Express just joined us. Okay. So this all started off with, as any illustration would do, trying to come up with a concept, right? So what I originally probably would have done was a Captain Stern hand over fist piece. But Jeff Johnson did one, and it was it was really good, or it is really good. So I was like, eh, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but anyways, you can see I've got a little hand over fist head drawing right there. Uh, there's Uncle Creepy there. And I finally decided, after, after I asked them, the people doing the book, what could I do? What couldn't I do? And they said, well, no Marvel and DC copyrighted characters and no Swamp Thing. You know, so basically anything they had to get rights for, they were not... Um, you know, too thrilled with that. I don't blame them. And I said, well, what about Uncle Creepy? And they said, anything but Marvel or DC. And I said, okay. So I thought, you know, Wrightson did a ton of work for Warren Magazine in the mid-70s. And it was some of his best comic work, if not his best comic work. And a lot of the things he did were these front cover illustrations to Creepy and Eerie Magazine. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to play off that and see what I can come up with. So I originally came up with this concept here, which was Uncle Creepy. He's got, he's holding a little candle holder and that that's the smoke from the candle. And I thought, well, I'd have like a dead guy, zombie type thing laying over here on books and just like have him in a big library. But that seems sort of, I don't know, boring to me. Um, so I thought, well, okay. So I was kind of messing around and I drew this big head of Uncle Creepy while I was thinking and I thought, well, wait a minute. Now, that could be interesting. What if we did this, you know, big shot of Uncle Creepy? And then I thought, well, what if I put Uncle Creepy in the foreground here and I had a bunch of monsters in the background? I thought, oh, that might be kind of cool. But then I was like, well, does that really say Wrightson, you know? So then I pulled back and I thought, well, what if I did Uncle Creepy with a candle similar to the other one, but like the Frankenstein monster back there? And I felt like, yeah, okay, but does that really, it doesn't really focus. It doesn't really... It's not thematic enough for me. It has elements of rights in it for sure, but it, I don't know, it just didn't, it, it seemed forced to me. It's kind of like, think of all the rights and things you can and throw them in a drawing. Well, it, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So I started messing around and, and I kept coming back to this headshot of Uncle Creepy. So then I came up with this and I thought, well, wouldn't that be interesting if we had Uncle Creepy holding a candle that had a bunch of like screaming heads. The candle was made up of, you know, yelling heads, which is something that, you know, rights and would have done. And him carrying a, a copy of a look back, the rights in retrospective, you know. And I thought, well, that that might work. So I kind of like that concept. And then, um, but I didn't like the I didn't like this face. I thought it was too not creepy enough for Uncle Creepy. So I started messing around and I came up with that face, which I really really liked. That's much more Uncle Creepy and much more rights in the Uncle Creepy, right? So that was that was the final concept drawing. Which then, are you ready, led to this. Okay, and this is where I'm at right now. Now, I had some suggestions. Oh, let me pull out just a bit on this. I had some suggestions from some people who were like, uh, I think it was sequential treasuries. Like, hey, how about having a portrait of Frankenstein back behind Uncle Creepy? And I thought about it. I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. And I started thinking about it. And yet the more I thought about it, the more it, it felt like, again, like I was just throwing stuff in the picture that, you know, Wrightson was known for, which is okay, but it didn't really give me the, the sense of tribute or direction that I really wanted. So then I thought, well, wait a minute. What if I had Wrightson's head, the young Wrightson that I remember when I was a, a kid, you know, not the, uh, the older Wrightson that we all know, you know, over the last several years, but about when he was young and in the, in the 70s when he was really doing all this brilliant work you know, and, and working on Frankenstein and all this, this Uncle Creepy stuff and the stuff that I grew up, you know, loving, the pre-1980 stuff. And so I thought, well, put the young rights in there. Okay, now we've got something. Now we've got something to me that sort of spells tribute, right? So you've got Uncle Creepy, who's a character that, you know, rights and uh, did quite a bit of work with. You've got like this candle here, if you can see, made up of all those faces and heads, right? I thought that was very rights me, right? And so I thought we have rights in up here in the smoke from the candle, 
Okay. And then we, we do the book thing, right? Now, I still haven't decided if this book is going to be Frankenstein or a look back. It'll be one of those two. We're not going to make that decision tonight, uh, but we are going to finish the rights and face, and we're going to do a bunch of cross hatching, which will probably kill me. Um, one thing of note I want to point out here as well. If you look at the shadow under Uncle Creepy's nose, originally when I put it in there, I thought there was too much of it. And so I went in and whited out some of it to cut it, and I think it looks better now. The problem is this is a cream colored paper and the whiteout is white. So you can kind of see the white and it kind of pisses me off to be honest with you. So being the anal retentive artist that I am, I'm going to mix up, not on camera, but I'm going to mix up some cream colored um, acrylic paint with a little bit of whiteout and go back over that so it matches the paper and you can't see it because it's bugging me that much. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to ink this background. We're going to ink right some. And we're going to ink the background. Oh, Shelly's trying to sneak in and she kicks the camera. My bad. Um, so anyway, let me take a quick look at uh, what you guys have been commenting whilst I've been uh, talking. And then we'll get to inking. Uh, you're doing, I'm wishing I could do. Thank you, Dr. Mask. Um, Darsh is in there. Yeah, Darth Let's Josh. Um, there's a little stern... Of course, from Heavy Metal, the movie, but also Heavy Metal, the magazine, where the story was. Brian, suddenly old, is here. I don't think Brian's as suddenly old as we are. Um, Did you go collector on expert? Well, I've covered most of them before oh. I started. Uh, Rice and Zombies. Rice and Zombies are really creepy. Such ghoulish work. I have some of that in the comic scene. Yes. there's a, He did a couple of, uh, com like, not only comic scene, but um, some of those other comic magazines that uh, I can't think of the name of them right now, but I have them. Um, I was going through the bookshelf yesterday and found my Creepy Presents Bernie Wrightson cover, hardcover. Yes, I've got that as well. I've do. got some great stuff. Of course I do. Of course you do. Uh, everybody commenting, saying nice things about the drawing. Thank you so nice. much. Um, the candle is creepy. It's supposed to be. I know. Hey, leg kick. There we go. The inks really make it look like like writes, writes and ask. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute before I start and what I did and what uh, writes and used to do. Cool. Um, <laughs> hey, John. Yeah, but the format of the book is 9 by 12. It's not 11 by 17. So the, the drawing can't be, I didn't want the drawing to be super tall, like 11 by 17 uh, comic book sized. So I didn't have as much breathing room up here to put a frame around it. And again, I felt that was, I don't know, too predictable to have like just, he's walking by a picture on the wall. I just thought it'd be more, I don't know, his head, you know, in the cloud or the smoke from the candle was my original idea. Yeah. Um, Showtime. Now it's a party. No, now it's a party, John. Ooh, you jealous, go. are you? I am. I'm jealous of the attention. White Claw. Um, yeah, I know. Hmm. Kitchen Sink, Daddy Five Issue Captain Stern series in like 93, yes. But his best Captain Stern story is the June 1980 issue of Heavy Metal. So that's the one that they based the Heavy Metal movie on, but it's it's really, really top-notch rights and work. So, okay. So let me, uh, let me point out a couple of things here. Hey, Peyton. The stream is saved. Oh, <laughs> oh. Get I'm him. sorry. Get him, Paul! Hang on one second here. Yeah. I'm going to mix it up. Yep. There you go, Peyton. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> well, I had to base it on me. You know that. So. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Where can I... Can we get the Bernie Wrightson book? Which one are we oh, talking yeah. about? The one you're working in, maybe? Oh, this one? Uh, I have no idea. It hasn't gone live yet. It's going to be a, a crowdfunded campaign, I think. And as soon as I find out, I will make sure that everybody knows. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the deal. If you look at these, this line work on his forehead, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what I did was I cheated. Um, what Wrightson would do is you take his brush or a brush. Well, it'd be his brush, I guess, since he owned it. Um, First of all, this is the brush I'm using. I have no way of knowing if this was what Wrightson used. This is a Kalinsky number two sized uh, red sable 
uh, Raphael, uh, and it's uh, it's from France, so it must be good. The serial number on these are 8404. They're terrific brushes because they have a great point. The problem is they don't last as long as the old Winsor Newtons used to, so you don't get as much life out of them, but they're not as expensive either. They're still about 15 or 16 bucks a piece, which isn't cheap, I guess, but I like these a lot. Um, I like it a lot. Yeah, you don't really have to break them in to get the point. The point just it doesn't mm. last as long as uh, the Winsor Newtons used to, but I don't really like the Winsor Newtons anymore because they're not as good as they used to be, so anyway. Um, so what Wrightson would do, let me demonstrate this with a clean brush. When he was feathering out of a black, there's two ways to do this. There's a, there's a way where you have the most control, and I will demonstrate this in a minute, actually, but it's when you go from thin to thick. You start with the tip of the feathering line, and you press down, and it gives you a little bit thicker line at the base. Mm. That gives you more control. That's how Gary Martin, the inker, does it. Brian Boland. And that's how they get that incredible control, is you go from thin to thick. Okay, what Wrightson would do would do just the opposite. He would brush out of the black, okay, which gives you less control over where your lines go, but it gives you a, you know, a looser kind of feel to it, softer, looser feel, which he was going for, more of a Frazetta type look, right? Um, then the then super, you know, controlled look that almost you can, you know, simulate a pen line if you want to. Um, what I did was kind of a combination of both. These are all thin to thick lines, even though they don't really look like it because I did them pretty quickly. So I, I had a measure of control, but still captured sort of that rights and feel to it. But you can see where it really doesn't have a rights and feel is right here on his butt chin. Look at how, look at how sharp and clean those lines are. That's what you get when you go from um, thin to thick. Now, if I had brushed out from the black, they would have been much softer and looser, which would have been more like Wrightson. But I don't know. I was I was fearful, and I, I wanted to do it and have control, and so I did it the opposite way. But some of this stuff in here, like on his bow tie, that is me brushing out from the black in very Wrightson-esque fashion. Um, so there's a combination of both of those things in here in an attempt to, to kind of cheat a little bit, get the rights and look overall, but on some areas where I just wasn't comfortable inking out from the black with my line work, I went the opposite direction. So to have maintained control. So you have a mixture here of kind of looseness and control uh, that I think still captures what uh, rights and might've done. Uh, these lines down here on his hand. Can you tell what brush that is again? Yeah. Um, a lot of these lines are pushing out from the black. So but they're short. So short lines are easy to do it that way because you don't you don't need the control that you do on much longer lines. Again, this is a Raphael Kolinsky, a Raphael Kolinsky brush. You have these orange tips on the back, a number two, and the serial number is 8404. You can order them through Dick's Dick. <laughs> you can oh. order them through Dick Blix. Be careful what you Dude, search. Right. right. You never know what will be coming up. So gonna, I want to say hi, Jeffrey. I'm gonna, said hi. Hey, I'm going to demonstrate these lines in just a minute live, but I'm going to I want to get this thing ready to go before I dip my brush because once we've dipped the brush, there's no turning back. No. no. Okay. What I'm going to do in this background is going to be a lot of work, but or busy work, but I want to kind of just kind of lightly pencil in so I have to make sure that I have some concept of what this is going to look like before I do it and go, hmm, that was a bad idea. Um, I'm going to have heavy blacks down in this area here. It's going to be all black, and it's going to feather out this way towards the candle. Can't really. There you go. Okay, I'm not really doing anything other than indicating so I have kind of an idea of what this might look like. See how I'm doing these lines like that? That's how you do it with a brush. That's how Wrightson would do it with a brush. But you just have to be careful. And uh, it's a much faster process for feathering, but it's, it's a looser process. So all this back here is going to be black and going into some cross hatching in the light. Okay, so you can have heavy black area back here. 
and a heavy black area down here that it's all going to feather towards the light. Then I'm going to go in over the top and cross hatch the crap out of it to all of this in here is going to be cross hatching and it's going to be lighter as it gets towards the light and it's going to get darker as it gets towards the dark shadow areas. So anyway, um, come hell or high water, that's what I'm going to do. But first let's finish rights in space. If you don't mind, Here's the picture I'm working from, found on the old Internet of Love. It's also in a couple of books that I have, but it was easier to find it on the Internet. So, you know, I did my best to kind of, you know, capture Wrightson's young 20-something look. Uh, to be that talented, be under 30 is uh, pretty remarkable. All right, the ink I'm using, uh, this is kind of a not really what this is. It's partially what it is. This is called, this is a speedball super black is what this is and i don't care how black they tell you the ink is it's not that black and so i always leave the the cap off for sometimes like a week or two so some of the extra water can evaporate out of it and then it becomes thicker and um but what can happen in that case is it can become too thick especially if you start using it regularly and forget to put the cap back on then it becomes like varnish and which you don't want. I mean, it does a real nice black as you can tell, but it gets a little too thick and, and hard to um, uh, get clean um, feather lines that you like. So I bought this, Dr. Martin's, and I have never used this before, but I thought yeah, you I'll give it a try. Else. I try, every time I go to the art store, I buy something else until I find something mm. I like. And this is black India, a Bombay black India, and then I'll try that. So I mixed it with whatever I had left in the bottle of the speedball ink. And uh, so that's what we're going to go with. And they say never mix inks, and that's, quite frankly, that's all I do. You are a rebel, well, Aaron. You no, know, uh, rules are made to be broken, right? So how do you determine the black areas? Um, well, you first of all figure out your light source. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this... Light source is the candle. The flame is right. about right here. So we're getting light on his head up here and on his face. And that would that's why the shadow is cast under his nose because the light's coming this way. Gotcha. And then on the chin as well, the top of his shoulder is catching some of that light right there. It's a black suit. So it, technically you wouldn't even really have to put highlights on mm -hmm. it, but I did because um, we want to see some of the wrinkles. Now, what Wrightson oftentimes would do, and I'm toying with still doing, is, is leaving open areas like this and then cross-hatching in them so they were still black but not as black as the darkest black. So you'd have this kind of gray cross-hatching area in there. Um, and again, so the light here is being, is being cast from the candle. That's where we're getting this. And as you can see, I put a little shadow underneath his hands and his fingers here mm -hmm. because the and, and down here in the palm of his hand. From the candle, I could also drop a shadow from that finger over there if I wanted to, but at some point it becomes too. Um, you don't want to. You don't necessarily have to be so literal because you're going to start. People are. It's not may not read well, right? As a design element on there, and you're like, what is that black mark? Oh yeah, it's the shadow. So sometimes you just back off and say, hey, I'm I'm not going to put that in there because uh, it's unnecessary. Um, and again, if you if you see the line work here. All the line work is going towards the light, okay? All the line work on this candle is going up towards the top where the flame is, where the light is. And all the lines on him are going towards the light, more or less, okay? And I've left this light back here, what we call like a rim light, which you might have a kicker light on the back of his head. Like if you watch Star Trek, they'll like have a purple light or some kind of funky 60s light coming from the side or the back of the character. So that means I can go all black back here and still leave this highlight in there. And I won't, he won't fade completely into the black, which sometimes you can do that and it looks really cool, but I didn't want to do that on this particular case. So anyway, let me do a quick demo here of what I'm talking about. And then we're going to ink right in space. So what I'll do is I've got a, uh, just an old spaghetti, uh, sauce jar there that doesn't have spaghetti sauce in it, but it does have very dirty ink water. So I'm going to go in there and dip the brush, get some of that extra water off. Okay, so then I go in here with the ink and I'll do this and I'll roll 
the ink on there to get a tip. Because I don't want too much ink on here, especially if I'm going to be feathering. Okay. So now here's the two kinds of feathering that we're talking about. Here's the Boland kind. If you're going into a darker shadow, you start from the tip to the base. Tip to the base. Tip to the base. Okay. Can you zoom in at all? Or is my already zoomed in all the way? Um, no, you got some. That's about it, though. Okay. And what this allows you to do is have much better control. Now, you've got to lock your wrist and the, um, the heel of your hand here, your thumb, so that you're getting this constant um, consistent curve. See? We go like that. And then this area, you know, you'd fill in and make that a black area, right? So you got all this feathering coming out of there. It's very controlled. Now what Wrightson, what Wrightson would do is if you had a black area here, right? He would come in here and he would go like this. Okay. And brush out from the black. So you're going from thick to thin. And how you're doing that is you're pressing and then you're lifting up. Pressing, lifting up like you're sweeping. Okay. But you're lifting up at the end. That gives you your tip. But it also, you're going to get some variance in your line. Uh, but which is fine. That's what Wrightson did. That's what he liked. Um, and so those are the two different ways you can feather. Um, like I said, I had, a com I had a combination of both. So, um, you know, wherever I felt like, you know, I really needed to maintain control of what I was doing, I would feather from thin to thick. When I wanted more softer, looser look, I would go out. And again, it's much easier on shorter lines than it is longer lines to, to ink out from the black. Now that we've done this, Okay, well, I just want to come in and say hi to everybody. I'm going to go back to cleaning, kind of. Kind of cleaning. Kind of cleaning. Kind of watching TV, kind of resting. Well, she heard her back, did so. <sighs> Playing with Husker is dangerous. I'm hurting Something. myself. Right. But I was trying to go through some questions, but I think... Um, did you share what we got in the mail today? I didn't, if you'd like to. I well. will. Um, and I'll rinse out periodically uh, just so that as the ink gets thicker and more varnishy, it, it won't gum up my brush. And I just use tissue paper to kind of quickly wipe off the base so I'm not getting a terrible amount of ink over my hand. Show. So some more merchandise that we'll probably be putting up soon. Very soon. soon. But let's see if they... I'll just... Can you lay it down on there against the black? Here we go. Wraith of God shot glasses. That's right. They're Look allegedly there. laser etched into laser the shot etched. glass. So. Super yep. cool. Have so those. they'll be up soon. Again, I'm going to roll off a lot of this ink after I dip it so that um, I don't have all that on my brush. Yeah, you should show me your table over here. Yeah. Ew. Okay. And then because I'm doing a likeness here, I'm really going to try and be very careful about making sure that I don't take any liberties with what's there in the pencils. Because it's just a, a, a line here and there can really change the look. Uh, come on, you've got to stop chewing that stuff. Okay. Actually, I got a new pair of glasses. They're really in interesting because they're only good. I mean, they're close-up glasses, and I can see much better with them. 
in my old close up glasses. The problem is you get about three feet and I, I can't see anything three feet away from me. So it's only really good for this close up work, which is good because that's what I'm doing right now anyway. Dang it. My light keeps changing on me. I apologize for that. I wonder if I, if I hit that, if that's going to help at all. Let me bring this down to this camera down. I need to get an overhead crane kind of uh, arm that holds this camera because it make a huge difference, I think. Because on this tripod, it's just in my way. But it's what I got to work with right now, so... What, did I have a view of my hat in there when I was uh, reaching over? No, I'm sorry. All right. Back to old uh, young Bernie here. All right, I'm going to... I gotta get some light on this because my shadow is... I'm going to get the shadow out of the way. Okay. So I'm really, even though it's a brush, I really am drawing very lightly with the brush. Very much like I would use a pencil when I'm doing stuff like this. It's got to be very light. My hat getting in the way. Problem is you get you get really small like this, and you can't really emulate that pencil line work that's in there because it's really it's kind of smudgy looking. You can a little bit like if you go dry brush, which and what I mean by that is you just have enough uh, just enough ink on the brush that it. Uh, the line breaks up as you ink. That's what we call dry brush technique. Frazetta used it a lot. Um, Wrightson used it. Mark Schultz uses it a lot. But again, again, very, very tiny lines here. With a very, very light touch. Very light. I don't even think you can see them, the cross hatch lines in there. But you will be able to see it when I scan it. And of course, I will be posting this. Um, and it's done. Now what I'll do after I get this done, I'll make sure my hat's not in the way, is it? What I'm going to do after I get this done is I will go back and kind of 
you know, take a look at the, the face, the photograph, and see if I screwed anything up to a point where maybe I need to go back in and do some touch-up stuff. Um, hopefully not. I'm one of those guys who just, I hate it when I have to put white out on my drawing, unless you're using it for effect. Right. Um, and I already pointed out the, the issue I had with the white on Uncle Creepy's lip not matching the paper, so it really drives me nuts, so I'm going to have to fix that, which is just silly. But actually, in some ways, it isn't because... We, um, in this day and age, it's like a lot of us, you know, we spend, uh, or I should say we have a lot of artwork that we end up selling. Um, and so where comic book art and illustration used to be just for considered production art, now it's, you know, almost in a way fine art. So it's like, you know, if I was going to sell this original, which I'm sure I will, um, you know, you don't want a couple spots of white out that sort of like are glaring, you know, if someone were to buy this, you know, and so that's why I'm going to go in and touch it up. But okay, so this nose line is going to be important because it's you know again if you don't hit the nose just right it's going to alter his looks so i'm doing very light brush work like if i was drawing very lightly with a pencil in that line so that i make sure that i, I don't go off of it I'm trying to be really soft on these shadows, this face, but um, the reality is if you look at the photo, these shadows come all the way down like this. Now these are very gray, but I might as well black them in because when I scan this, it is going to go black. So again, I'm just kind of drawing a little bit with a brush here to kind of get the effect that I want. Now in his photo, he does have some shading over his eye here. All right, so I'm not going to go in with a brush and do the pupils to his eyes because um, that'd just be showing off, and if I screwed it up, it would be embarrassing. So it's much easier to do that with a, with a pen, so I'm going to do that with a pen. So I've got a point .3 here. Actually, I'm going to do it with a point one. Let's go to point one micron. I'm going to go in here. That little highlight in there because it makes the uh, gives the eye a little bit of life. There we go, young Bernie Wrightson. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, wear my shoulder out by doing some really long feathering, but I'm going to do it 
with uh, the Boland technique, which is, of course, going from thin to thick. And then I'm going to cross hatch over the top of it with a pen. Um, David Brohawk Williams is in the house. Hope everybody says hi to David and Bax. Of course, his wonderful project, Truth, Justice, American Way, over on Indiegogo. Sequential Treasure says, comic illustration art was always fine art. People just didn't notice it until there was a collector's market for it. Well, that's true, but it was treated by a lot of the artists and editors especially as just production art. Yes, but my point is, I mean, I use whiteout all the time, too, to correct mistakes. But if you're doing it on white paper and you do it correctly, no one really notices. But you do it on cream-colored paper with whiteout, and it stands out like a sore thumb. That's my problem. And this is cream-colored paper. It's not white paper. So I really want, <laughs> I want to cover it up. I mean, I just can't help myself. It's just like it's a very small thing right there, but i got to fix it. Um, so anyway, I take a break from my brush. I'm not going to wash it out. I'm going to rinse it out. And uh, I don't want to wait so long to use it again that it gets dry and hard from the ink on there. But I do want to um, finish this candle holder. And I'm not going to do it with a brush because rights and would have in this situation. But to me, it's, it's a non-organic uh, piece. So... I can use a pen to make it a little bit more hard lined. In fact, in some ways, I prefer that rather than, um, you know, some, some artists don't, don't like pr particular artists that I like because they use, everything looks the same. They don't separate their textures. All right. Which is a valid argument. Um, but if someone does really cool line work, I don't give a rip. Um, but this is this is kind of an example of no one's really going to notice it but i have more control with the pen because the pen i can use like a pencil which we're all infinitely more comfortable using than a brush in most cases and um so i can you know if i want to line thicker i can just go back in and thicken it up you know like i would if i was using a, a pencil and with a brush i got to be right on the money controlling my the pressure that I um, use to control the line weight where I don't really have to worry about that with a, a pen because it's going to give me the same line thickness regardless. Let's see, I can go in and put in a little heavier shadow underneath these ridges. Okay, and no one's the wiser. I mean, you guys are because you're watching me do it, but. And I put a little extra detail onto this thing simply because, you know, it's a rights and tribute piece and he's a guy that would go in there and just make ridiculous, you know, detail and, you know, who, who knows what kind of crazy ornamentation, right? Some would have put on just a simple candle holder. Um, I sadly do not have his same level of imagination for that kind of thing. Um, so this is what I consider for me to be sort of ornate, um, not particularly clever, but, you know, it's right and what I'm sure would have done it a hundred times better and more interesting, but it's just a little only. I'm going to do the best I can with the tools God gave. All right. And writes and would leave some lines undefined and let your eye fill in the uh, blank. Right, so 
on this, I don't know if you can really see it here or not, but these ridges here, they're actually double, there's, they're, they're not just single line, they're, they're double thickness, but I'm not gonna ink the inside line. I'm gonna leave it white and uh, let your eye um, fill in the blanks because that's something that Wrightson would have done. I think I should also ink the edge of this book since I'm going to be inking around it. If I don't create an edge here, I'm going to ink right on through it and then I'll have to white out the extra lines. I might still make a mess, but I'm going to at least establish the outline of this book before I start <clears throat> feathering. And I have no idea at this point what kind of detail I'm going to put into this book cover. Um, it's one of those things I'm still kind of thinking about. I'm going to round that a little bit because it's a book. And I don't want it to look completely square and straight. Because we have to imagine this has been read a little bit. If it's Frankenstein or if it's uh, a look back, it certainly got read in my house. So, so I'll round this corner a little bit here. I'm going to go ahead and do the edge of the book here. Sure it's thick enough. I might go in and thicken that up at some point. But uh, okay, so there's our book. And like I said, it's either going to be this is I did the, the dimensions to perfectly fit a look back, so I could actually just paste in Photoshop the cover of in black and white to uh, a look back on here if I decide to go that route. If I go Frankenstein, I'm going to uh, I'll drop in the lettering. Like in Photoshop, I'll use some sort of Gothic lettering to write Frankenstein across here. The thing is, if I do like a Frankenstein head or something, it's going to be mostly covered up by his hand, so there's not um, a lot to see there. So that's why I'm thinking maybe a look back. But either way, his arm is covering up whatever the, the, the book uh, jacket illustration would be. So um, I don't know. I'll decide. I'm afraid if I do a look back, after I do it, they're going to say, oh, we can't do that because it's there's a copyright problem. And so then I have to turn it to Frankenstein anyway. So I might just do Frankenstein anyway, so I don't have to go back and change it. Jeff, are you insinuating that Uncle Creepy looks like uh, President Joe Biden? Is that what you're saying? Um, <laughs> you should, should to the book title Frankenstein. It just feels right, because it does. Uh, Marcus Kilgrew said, I met Rice in 2000 at New York Con, and again, years later at Heroes Con, he was a very nice guy. He was. I met him multiple times, and he never remembered me the next time I saw him, which is very discouraging for someone who idolized him as much as I did growing up, uh, that uh, I had dinner with him, I had drinks with him, I sat next to him at shows, uh, and he was always very gracious, and we'd talk and stuff like that, and then I'd see him at the next show, and he had no clue who I was. <laughs> So it's a story of my life, man. I don't know what it is. I must just be incredibly forgettable. Um, Matthew says, I'm sorry, This is if, if this is a stupid question, Aaron. No, there's no stupid questions. There's only stupid answers. Mm, that isn't right either. Aaron, but did you meet Bernie? I, well, there you go. I'm telling you the whole story. Um, the very first time I met Wrightson, I... Um, I was, I was like at San Diego in 88 or 89. Um, and I had my hardcover edition of Frankenstein. And uh, so there was this panel that he was on. And I, I was asking him, I'd raise my hand and ask a question about like contract negotiations and stuff like that. Because I was really curious about the financial aspects of, you know, being a comic book artist. Because what I... 
what I imagined was, you know, like when he did his Frankenstein portfolios, I would sit there and go, okay, these are $20 a piece is what they were charging at the time they came out in 78. And I said, there's, he's doing a 2000 print run. So I said, okay, so he's making $40,000 on these. If he sells all of them. Okay. Which is dumb because I would never factor in, oh yeah, there's printing costs and whoever's doing it for him is getting a piece of the action and the distributor's getting a piece of the action. And so I, you know, I would just go, wow, you could make a living because, you know, in 78, $40,000 was a decent amount of money. Um, so one of the first questions I asked him was about contracts and stuff. And he goes, eh, he goes, I got a friend who does that. You know, if I have a question about a contract, I just ask him, you know, that was his answer. I'm like, mm, okay. And, uh, so anyway, I'm going to do these lines and kind of create a, a black area here. And then I'm going to cross hatch over the top of those lines, hopefully to get an easier blend into the cross hatching because I want it to be solid black and then cross hatch out to a gray. Um, so anyway, and I, I did ask a question about a, a poster that he did, or I should say a poster that he was going to do. He finished the art, but it never got officially released when he did it. Um, it's called Moonpool, and it's that uh, guy looking into a like a little pond, and his reflection is a werewolf. And what I asked him was if because the guy in the in the picture of Moonpool. Now you'll have to go back with me to I think it was 1980 when the the Howling came out. Let me pull this up real quick so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, the werewolves in there looked very Wrightson-esque, right? And so I asked him, I said, you know, um, bear with me here. Okay, let me share this with you. Anyway, I asked him if he had, you know, if he got any money or if they paid him or if he was the one who designed the werewolves and stuff. And he made some snarky comment, not snarky at me, but he was obviously, it was a sore spot. And he was like, yeah, I never saw it. Yeah, well, I asked him if he worked on the film and he goes, not officially. I never got any money for it. So his intimation was the same as mine, that they had sort of ripped off his designs and stuff from his art and used it in the movie. But, you know, he never got hired to do the the work on the film. So anyway, he, um, one of the lead character, well, not one of the lead characters, but one of the main character, werewolf characters in the film look exactly like this guy looking into the pond. He had kind of the, the longer hair parted in the middle, hanging down like that. And, uh, I was like, wow, that's the guy from Moonpool. And then the werewolf designs were very rights and ask. And uh, so th that was, and, and then after the show, I went up to him and waited in line and he had him sign my book. And I said, you know, thank you for all the art lessons growing up. And, you know, that was about it. And, uh, but the, the worst story I have for rights and as I sat next to him at a Seattle show and, um, He was, uh, and it was funny because I, I figured he would, this was in the early nineties. I figured he had no clue who I was, you know, he, he, but he was just by happenstance was sitting next to me at the table and maybe he saw my banner, you know, or my, not my banner, but my, uh, yeah, my, my, um, yeah, I guess it would be my banner. It sounded so pretentious when I said it that way, my banner, uh, but my, uh, retractable banner that had my name on it, you know, so, cause I don't necessarily think he really knew who I was. Um, but anyway, so he was like, yeah, you're a little presty, you know, you know, this kind of stuff. And so he was working on, um, someone came up and said, Hey, can you do me a quick sketch? He said, sure. And I was 
sitting next to him. And at the angle I was sitting at, I was looking at him, or whatever he was drawing, upside down. Okay. Those lines are terrible, by the way. Um, but it's okay, because I'm going to cross that over the top of them. So I'm not being particularly... exacting so he's drawing this piece of he's drawing this little sketch for this guy he doesn't tell him what he what it's going to be right and he starts drawing it and it looks like a bat you know and i looked at it and I immediately could tell, well, not immediately, but within a second or so, I could tell what it was. And I just blurted out, oh, that's Karloff is Frankenstein. And he looked up at me and was, you could, you, if, if looks could kill, because I blew the surprise, I just blurted it out. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. But what he had done was he had drew the brow first and the eyes, and it looked like a bat. But I guess me being a um, rights and expert or self-proclaimed rights and expert uh, that I was able to figure out what he was doing and he was not happy with me. So, I mean, after that, it was a good thing he didn't remember me, but, um, you yeah, know, that was my, um, my rights and experience <laughs> or one of them. He was at a Portland show. I went to dinner with him, asked him a ton. I mean, it was such a fanboy. I mean, it was like asking him about, you know, I saw this half-finished drawing you did once, and it was this, that, and you know, go, do you remember that was Ford? He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about, man. Um, it reminded me of that um, episode of Saturday Night Live when uh, Shatner was guest hosting, and he was at the con at the uh, Star Trek convention. And it was Dana Carvey or somebody said, hey, hey, you know, episode, you know, whatever, when you were getting in the safe to get this thing. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, do you remember what the combination of the safe was? You know, and Shatner's just like, what? And that was kind of how I felt like when I was asking him these questions because I had so much of his work memorized. And... You know, I, I could remember half-finished drawings that I'd seen someplace. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. I wonder why he didn't finish that. So I'd ask him that, and he's like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So. And let's see. I was at Motor City Con one time, and actually, Chaikin comes up to me the first time I met Howard Chaikin. He goes, because I was working on the Ultraverse stuff, like Sludge. And he goes, comes up to me and Jake and says, yeah, someone introduced this. Go, yeah, this is Aaron O'Presti. He goes, oh, yeah, you do sludge, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, um, that stuff doesn't suck. And I thought, well, I guess from Howard Chaikin, maybe that's a compliment. And so anyway, and then Wrightson showed up a little bit later. And so we ended up having drinks with Chaikin and Wrightson. But I just sat there and listened. I didn't really have much to say. Now, again, you can see how tiring this is to do this, <laughs> but you get all these lines down, <clears throat> and then I'm just going to mess them up by cross-hatching the heck out of, over the top, of them, much like I'm doing with Wraith of God, and, um, and trying to create sort of a Wrights and Frankenstein cross-hatch effect, which is really what he got from Franklin Booth, to be honest. Because the technique he's using in the Frankenstein book is very inspired by Franklin Booth. And if you don't know who Franklin Booth is, you should Google him and check him out. Say turn of the century black and white illustrator. And uh, you'll you'll see the uh, 
influence that his work had on uh, what Wrightson was attempting to do with Frankenstein. And it's because, you know, Frankenstein is a 19th century novel, and so he wanted to do the illustrations in a style that was 19th century. And so that's kind of what Booth, obviously Booth was a 19th century artist, as well as a 20th century artist, but um, but Booth started in the late 1800s, if I'm not mistaken, and so Wrightson was using that sort of approach, um, which is really very sort of what would be considered classical illustration now. Now, I'm not going to do all the cross-hatching in brush because that would just be insane. Somebody like Gary Martin would do that, but Gary's insane, so that's okay. I'm not insane. So I'm going to do it with a pen. Wrightson's one of the few guys who would combine pen techniques and brush techniques in the same illustration and get away with it. I mean, sometimes he didn't. There's a couple of illustrations that didn't work, um, like in Frankenstein, where the contrast between the real heavy black and the Franklin Booth line work just didn't really work. And he didn't end up using those pieces in the book because he, he saw the same thing I did. He was like, oh, eh, that doesn't really work. Um, Usually I use a crappy brush to uh, do this, fill in the black areas, um, but I don't have a crappy brush sitting handy, so we're going to use this nice brush and turn it into a crappy brush by misusing it to do this. Use your crappy brushes to fill in your blacks. As you can see, I'm going, I didn't put a border on this drawing either. I'm going all the way to the edge. Um, and don't ask me why I didn't, but I didn't. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in all this black. And I really don't need to do this until I'm done with the piece, but I kind of want to, when I'm doing the cross hatching, I want to know what it looks like as I'm moving forward, how it's working with uh, the black areas. And if I have the blacks in here already, then I can blend the cross hatching into the black the way I want it to look. Otherwise, I would probably get it done and say, oh yeah, that looks pretty good. Then I'd fill in the black and go, okay, it's not gradual enough from the black to the light areas. So I'd have to go back in over the top anyway. So if I just fill in these blacks now, then I'll know exactly what I'm looking at. Now these corners here were a little bit of white showing. I might go in with a marker and just blacken those up, even though they're not going to show because this illustration is going to get trimmed around the edges before it gets uh, visually not. I'm not going to actually trim it, like cut it or anything, but um, I'll trim it around the edges in Photoshop so that it it fits into a 9 by 12 um, format. All right. And blacken in around this hair because I think this little detail of the hair will get lost in the crosshatch. So I could come in here and I'm going to just for the heck of it do a little bit of rights and feathering to kind of do start some crosshatching here. And it's a very heavy line and I don't really care because I'm just trying to get these lines coming out of the black to break up a little bit and then because I'm going to really cross out the crap out of them with a pen here in a minute um, and you won't even be able to see these lines anymore 
but they're starting to create an edge for me, a blending edge from the light to the dark, or from the dark to the light. Oops, where are we at right there? Nope, there it is. So basically I'm just trying to get a little bit of crosshatch going there, and I'm gonna get a really finely detailed crosshatch with the pen, because to get a super fine detail with a brush is a chore. And to be honest with you, I've been, I'm on page, I just finished page 68 of Wraith of God, so I've inked 68 pages with a pen, not even picked up a brush hardly at all during the whole process. So I have not picked up a brush in a long time. And I'm doing this whole thing in brush. And again, <clears throat> it takes an amazing amount of concentration and control. And you have to kind of work at a very slow but controlled speed to keep from getting sloppy. And I'm not really good at that because I get bored. I don't want it to go faster. So I start inking faster and then it gets sloppy looking. So there's no way I'm going to attempt to do cross hatching with a brush. Um, I'm not going to do the whole background because you know, it'll be like six hours later, but I'm going to do this area up at the top. And I have a couple of options here. I'm going to cross hatch all the way to where I've um, indicated the smoke line, which is right here. I'm gonna cross hatch up to that. And I can either be really careful with my lines or after I cross hatch there, I can take some white out and just create a real hard edge right there, um, which is probably what I'll do. Um, but then it won't match the paper. So maybe I will, uh, I'll have to create a new whiteout, the cream colored whiteout to use on this. But anyway, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to start with a five anyway. Micron and start cross hatching the crap out of this. And we'll just see what happens. I'll only go for about 20 more minutes and then I'll cut you guys loose, but because you'll have already seen everything I'm attempting to do and then you'll you know probably get boring after a while. I do so want to I also want to point out that this um, paper is very textured. And so if you wanted to get a dry brush look, and what do I mean by dry brush look like this stuff right in here where you, you, know, you can't really see it all that well, but it's starting to break up a little bit. The line work is. And that's because the, the brush is starting to run out of ink and it's a very rough surface. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, super rough. This isn't like watercolor rough, but it is, it does have probably a medium, yeah, probably a medium bristle finish on it. And you can, it's really easy to get a dry brush effect if you want one. Okay, so when Wrightson did all that cross-hatching and line work on Frankenstein, he was using a pen. Not a pen like this, but a Crowquill pen, which is basically a pen with a little nib in it that you dip into the ink and, you know, uh, ink like that. I don't use those because I have a tendency to splatter them and make messes, which um, kind of pisses me off, and then ends up ruining the artwork, or you have to go get more white out. Okay, so you see how heavy those lines are right there that I brushed in there? I've got to cross hatch over the top of this enough until those soften and disappear. And you can do it really quickly. You don't have to, like I'm doing here, this very methodically spaced lines, right? You want to be better about that if you're getting into a gray area or a lighter area. But if you're just trying to get rid of that black and make this kind of blacker, you can just kind of go for it. I'm going to scribble even a little bit, which I'm going to do right here. But essentially what you end up with is a, 
It's a black area with just a little, some white areas popping through. And um, you slowly create the gradient from solid black to white. So you can see in here now, those lines are less visible. Now you're getting reflection off that black. But you can see when this scans, this will all scan black right here with a little bit of white dotting in here. And it will create that sort of uh, blend that I want. But these pens, these micron pens are not black as the ink is. So they tend to be a little bit grayer and a little bit more um, matte looking. So in the original, they look different than they will when they're scanned because they all this stuff scans completely black. Even if it's a little bit grayer, they all, if you, if you scan it um, in bitmap, which I do at very high resolution, like 1200 DPI, which is people tell you is overkill, but I do it anyway. Um, all these lines will reproduce as the same color of black. The only other problem I have when I do stuff like this is that the I think these microns pick up some of the varnish off the, the black India ink, and so it tends to clog the tips of the pens eventually. Um, but I've never been one to worry about destroying my tools. I just get more. Um, one thing about being an artist and being in business, I mean, I mean that is a business, right? It doesn't seem like it, but it is and I'm actually incorporated. And so when you take a look at, you know, what a normal business costs of, you know, operating are, you know, sometimes astronomical, even small businesses. But for an artist, it's just like, the only expense you really have is your paper and your tools. So even though these pens, yeah, they're $4 a piece or whatever, you know, are expensive. And the big picture over the course of a year, when I'm doing my taxes, I'm always like, Oh, I wish I had more write-offs because I, I really spend very little money in the course of doing my work because um, I'm not buying big machinery or anything like that. I'm buying, you know, simple tools like pens and ink, erasers and pencils. Um, And as they get farther away from the black, these lines will be super close together and they get farther apart. You know, so I'm essentially scribbling here. And then as I get away from the black, I'm going to go with lines that are farther apart. And I just continue to cross hatch over the top, over the top, over the top to get it, you know, as dark as I want it to be. Charm can definitely get tired. See, and I'll look at and have certain, you know, have kind of like this black streaking in there like that, where it's maybe darker in some areas than others. And you just have to make the decision if that's kind of the look you want. Um, if it isn't, then you just go over it. You just keep cross hatching over the top of it until it gets dark enough that I don't know if I necessarily anymore. I mean, there would have been a time where I would have created this really hard edge of black right here, and, and the cross hatching would have followed that path. And now I kind of like a little bit more randomness to what I'm doing. Um, again, it's pure taste, right? Subjective taste, artistically speaking. So I don't really mind it. Uh, varying a little bit like that and, and putting a little bit of texture back in there. 
Um, you know, it's interesting. People do like uh, guys that really know their stuff when it comes to inking. They will go in there when an ink's wet, like a, they'll lay down some brush ink and, and they'll you know smudge it with their thumb and create a texture with their fingerprint, which I had never thought of before. That Art to Bear was showing, or you know, I saw Art to Bear do that. And I was like, God, that's a great idea. It's just a different way of you know creating texture. Um, like if I wanted to, I'm not going to because it's something Brightson wouldn't have done this, but you know, you could go in and get your finger, get ink on your thumb, and just go in here and like smudge it around in here and create a different texture that would probably look really, really cool. But like I said, it's not something that Wrightson ever did that I'm aware of. So, you know, my approach to this illustration is not just, oh, I'm going to draw some characters that, you know, Bernie drew, and that's going to be my tribute. I wanted this to look as much like a Wrightson illustration as I could do. So, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want to say I'm copying Wrightson, obviously, because this is an original drawing, an original concept, but it's, I wanted to use Wrightson techniques so that I was really paying tribute to him as the artist uh, as much as, you know, paying tribute to him as a creative force. And a, um, but I, I spent so much time studying his technique uh, growing up that, you know, I, I really wanted to kind of have that be a part of what I was doing here and not just, well, this is Aaron Lopresti drawing Uncle Creepy um, in tribute to Bernie Wrightson, but it's Aaron Lopresti drawing like Uncle Creepy like Wrightson might have done it. And uh, but as you see, if, as, as you as you layer the cross, I'm sorry, as you layer the cross hatching in there, it gets pretty, um, it can get pretty textury in terms of like the dark and light areas, but it looks pretty good. And, you know, you don't, again, it doesn't have to be this perfect, every line perfectly straight. And um, you just have to understand how to get these things to go from dark to light. And once you do that, then you're on to something, right? And you've got a, a feel or a technique that, you know, probably people are gonna accept. And, and I don't know that Wrightson's, even his Frankenstein stuff wasn't like these little perfect lines. There was a lot of it he did by kind of feel. And that's kind of what I've tried to adopt in my approach to my work, at least recently, because I've been so, for so many years, hung up on perfect detail and perfect lines and everything's got to be perfect, but God, there's nothing perfect about art. You know, it, it needs to have some sort of, you know, I hate to sound like a, you know, like a pipe smoking turtleneck wearing pseudo intellectual, but there's got to be a certain amount of emotion carried over into your work, spontaneity, you know, because otherwise it's just pure technique. And although there's something to be admired about pure technique, technique is something that anybody can learn, like painting technique. But, you know, how interesting is the drawing that you're painting? You know, you know, having expressive line work and a style that's sort of is interesting and unique from what other people are doing is as important as how well your technique is well executed, how, you, how, how well executed your technique is, is what I'm trying to say. So for the life of me, I can't figure out why this stupid camera does not give me a sharper picture when I'm paying for HD. I think it has something to do with my cable or the connection here someplace. I haven't quite figured it out. I need a tech genius to come in here and explain to me why. Because I, I guarantee when I show this to you, um, 
from the camera that's built into my Mac, it'll look clearer than this does. And this is a pretty expensive camera, so there's no reason why this should not. And it's transmitting in high def, so there's no reason why this should not be clearer than it is. So I don't know. That pisses me off. Um, so anyway... Okay, so imagine that all around here. What joy, huh? It's going to be a little bit of work, but it's going to be worth it. I think it'll look really cool. Uh, so let's let's do the wonderful thing and um, come back to looking at me because that's what you really want to see anyway, right, is old man Aaron. I just watched Logan, the movie, the other day. It was old man Logan, so now I'm old man Aaron. Man, what a violent movie that was. Anyway, okay. So you can probably see that crosshatch better now. Okay, so you can see that there is some, you know, different levels of darkness kind of creeping in there. But it gives it kind of a randomness that I'm, I'm okay with. I kind of dig it. Because otherwise it would be this perfectly curved line. And it, I don't know. This to me just... I don't know, it gives it a little bit of energy and and uh, and it writes and was never about, you know, overly um, all the lines being perfect. It was never about that. It was about evoking emotion. But anyway, so that I'm gonna do all that kind of crazy cross etching down here. And uh, I don't know if I'm gonna leave this area clean or not. We'll see. I think I'm still going to cross hatch a little bit in there, but it's not going to be as intense as what I've got going up here. But anyway, my goal was to kind of make this look like, you know, what if Aaron tried to do rights and, and, and I think it does. I think I've captured rights and feel to it. You know, it's not exactly what he would have done, but I think it feels like that. So Anyway, as soon as I get all this cross hatching done, which may be very late tonight, um, I will post that for you guys to see. Um, I, I know you guys have been making a lot of comments here, and I haven't got to all of them, and I apologize for that. Um, um, make the book cover Wraith of God. <laughs> That's like product placement, right? It's like... Uh, like, was it, what movie was it that Demolition Man where Taco Bell was everywhere because Taco Bell paid to be in the movie? Yeah. Um, I mean, a book of forbidden science. Mm. Make it an ancient spell book. He might have been, but I don't think so. <laughs> I just think it was like, you know. It's so funny when you care so much about someone, you know, uh, and then that someone doesn't give a rip about you. It's easy for you to remember the person where it's very easy for them to forget you. And uh, I don't mean that in a mean way, but I mean, I was like, who was I? I was just another comic book artist, right? That need probably met hundreds. Um, in my mind, it was like, you know, you're, you're my idol, you and Frazetta, you know? And, um, and I really thought after, you know, four or five times that I'd seen him at shows that um, it wasn't like I had this full head of hair the next time I saw him, I was bald. You know, I mean, it was, you know, all within the, you know, within probably a six or seven year span where I, I met him like, you know, five times and I just finally gave up. I said, I, I can't keep humiliating myself to my idol. So, um, you know, Daniel, um, you should take a selfie after this. There you go. Um, well, let's see. There you go. He's got an issue of the cult that Bernie signed for me. Also got it signed by Starlin and Denny O'Neill. Very cool. I remember when that came out. That was late 80s, like 88, I think, 87, 88. Um, yeah, The Howling is a great werewolf movie. And the Eye of Newt cookbook. There you go. It's fitting you chose Uncle Creepy for this piece. Bernie published some fan art in Creepy no, Number Nine way back in 1966. Well, you know, it's like I first discovered Wrightson in probably 1980, 
probably 1976. I was probably 12 years old. And we would, me and my neighborhood friends, we all collected comics and we'd go to these used bookstores in Portland that had comics, old comics in them. And we'd buy back issues. And the one guy, <laughs> this was an interesting dude. He, this, he had this bookstore that was right next to this porn theater, right? And so he had a ton of porn books. He was, he'd sell porn magazines and he had this one small section in comics. So as the kid, you know, if you were a kid, you could come in and you, but you couldn't go into the porn section. Obviously you go into the comic section, but this guy was a advisor to the overstreet price guide. Okay. So he was this porn peddler, but also, uh, you know, comic book expert. And he had all these copies of Swamp Thing. And he was saying, you know, dude, you said you should check these out. He goes, this guy's going to be the next big hot artist, you know? And so I, I looked at the Swamp Thing stuff and I thought, oh, this is really cool. So I bought all the Swamp Things on this guy's recommendation. And then I just slowly became obsessed with rights and I was thinking how cool it was. But it wasn't until um, probably 77 or 78 when the Frankenstein portfolio started coming out and I was like, wow, this is, this is next level. Cool. And then of course, by the time they advertised for a look back to be published in 1979, I had to have it. And by then I was, I had become a rights and honk and my, my style was leaving, you know, the mainstream superhero influences and, and just becoming totally rights. And um, for probably about three years from when I was like fifth, 14 to whatever, 14 to when I was 17 or 18 or 15 to when I was 18, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so it was, um, and, and, and it was seeing those creepy magazines. I found out again, these had already come out, right? When I discovered rights and he was already in the studio with Smith and Kaluta and they were doing their, you know, their comic art as fine art pursuits. You know, they were self-publishing prints, portfolios, posters, things like that. And I didn't, so I'd already missed all the creepy stuff and the, you know, the DC house of mystery stuff and the swamp thing stuff. So I, I started collecting all those as back issues. And it's when I saw the, all the, uh, the rights and stuff in the Morin magazines, that was like the height of his comic book work. It was just brilliant. You know, the pepper Lake monster, the black cat, cool air, all these great stories in there. And I was going out of my way to find him and just being blown away, you know, when I found him. It's like finding treasure. And so then by the time, like I said, when I discovered Frankenstein, Frankenstein started coming out, the portfolios did. And then the uh, look back, uh, I was just a rights and honk at that point, you know. And so, yeah, so I spent my whole life idolizing this guy. And so when I met him, it was no big deal to him, but it was a huge deal to me. And uh, so unfortunately, he just couldn't remember me. Yeah, he'd see, oh, crap, it's that kid who asked the financial stuff. <laughs> Get away from that egghead. Uh, it's so true. I am. I mean, we all are, right? I mean, it's just because I was fortunate enough to, to break into the business doesn't mean that I was, you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't, you know, as big a fan of the stuff as you guys are or were when you were kids as well. I'm just older. Look at that. A few years back, I lucked out and bought a CGC Sledge and one signed by me. It's not exactly a uh, hot commodity, but maybe someday. I've got a, I got a closet full of uh, the limited edition silver cover ones that I had Ross Ritchie. Ross Ritchie, the publisher and CEO of Boom, uh, used to work at, um, at Malibu when I was there doing Ultraverse stuff. And when it was going under, I'm like, dude, get me as many copies of Sludge Number One as you can. <laughs> he just got me like this, stacks of them. Uh, why do artists always think watching them draw is boring? Ethan says the same thing. I could watch for hours. Well, you know, it's I, I get self-conscious because it's like you guys are, I, you know, you're commenting and I can't watch the comments. I'm drawing and then I have to keep looking up to see if the... Uh, if, if the drawing is still in frame or if my head got in the way of the camera, you know. Um, um, I am wired in. That's the thing. We got it. This is not Wi-Fi. This is uh, cable. We hooked up from the, uh, the internet 
uh, where it comes in the house into the TV downstairs and ran a, an Ethernet cable all the way up here and hooked it directly into the computer. So the picture should be better than it is. I don't know what's going on. $100 confirmed. And that's Canadian. So that's even less money. Um, looking at what modern comic creators are making in the mainstream, it's like finding garbage. <laughs> How to serve man? I gotta know. Is that like uh, like the cookbook? How to serve a? You know, I'll tell you something. If you guys don't know, the Wrightson did two stories for a DC comic called Plop, and these were twenty cent comics, so it would have been probably seventy three. And um, issue number one is the Frog Legs story, which is the very famous one. But I'm telling you, look for Plop number five because that has a short rights and story in it. And it's one of the, it's probably the best thing he ever did um, in color comics. Uh, the black and white, you know, Warren stuff was next level, but it's, that's his best story. And if you haven't seen it, which most of you probably have not, go find a copy of Plop number five. It was a DC weird humor magazine. They had all these twisted uh, uh, Basil Go, uh, not Basil Gogos, but uh, Basil Wolver Wolverton, um covers and it was just a really funky weird comic in fact allow me to uh let me to show it to you if i can find a decent that's not i hate these people that don't put up big scans all right, that's good enough. We'll use that. Let's get rid of that. I got so much stuff on my desktop. I was gonna do a, uh, I was gonna do a live stream with um, Andy Smith and talk about giant size comics and, and treasury editions, and then I had to take my son to the airport and it blew up. Didn't get to do it. So I've got all these covers on my desktop for a future show. Um, okay. Let me do this. There it is, plop number five. Um, find that comic and you'll find one of the best rights and stories in there. It's just the artwork is just, you know, crazy good. So, I'm here to impart knowledge. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, you know, um, he did, and he did some. Uh, he did one. I <laughs> he did one that I was so offended by. It is one of the reasons that I sold my uh, rights in collection when I was eighteen. I mean, one of the reasons was I was I was using him too much as a crutch. Excuse me, I just dropped something, and um, he uh, and I thought I I need to break away from you know just how would rights and do these rocks? How would rights and do this? How would rights and do that? Because I didn't want to become just a you know copycat of rights and. But also I saw this National Lampoon story he did uh, where it was a parody of Bewitched and it was really kind of borderline porno. And it was like, I don't know, it just, it really rubbed me the wrong way, so to speak. So I was like, it, it was one of those things where I was kind of like, you know, you you find out your idol, you know, it's like you idolize Johnny Depp and you find out he's, you know, he's a big weirdo or something. Um, not that Wrightson was a weirdo, but I'm just saying he made it, he made a choice that I would not have made. And so <clears throat> I was really upset about it. So I got rid of my entire rights and collection. And then I grew up and realized that not everybody thinks the same way I do. And so if they're doing something I don't like, I just avoid the stuff that they do that I don't like and, you know, enjoy the stuff they do like. And so that I end up buying back all my rights and stuff at uh, inflated prices. So it was kind of a, um, a weak, not a weak moment, but a, uh, something an 18 year old might do self-righteous 18 year old might do. But I will say this, all the rights and comics that I, books and stuff I sold, I have them all back and the comics are in better condition than they were when I bought them when I was a kid. So, you know, there you have it. Yeah, Marcus Killigrew, he, he, yeah, he knows which one I'm talking about. So it was, um, anyway, that's a fun book that Starlin wrote. Yeah, I picked that up too. That was in the 80s. In fact, I picked that up at Golden Apple Bookstore 
on Melrose Avenue in LA when I was down there going to film school. That's where I went to get comics was, um, for the most part, was Golden Apple. And uh, later when I moved to Culver City, um, there was a, I think it's Overland Boulevard runs kind of down there. And uh, there was a comic shop there that I would go to because it was closer to my apartment. Because getting all the way down to Hollywood to uh, Golden Apple was a chore. When I lived on campus, it was it was okay because it was a it was kind of a straight shot down to Hollywood. It was a, it was a drive, but it was kind of a straight shot. But when I got over to Culver City, you have to get on the ten freeway, which was always you know a nightmare. And so yeah, I never made it. So I found a shop closer to where I lived. But yeah, Golden Apple. Yes, Blop does have all the Basil Wolver, uh, Wolver, Basil Wolverine covers. Wolverton covers, yes. All right, guys. <clears throat> there you have it. Again, um, you'll probably see this posted tomorrow on social media. And you'll, when you get the scan of it, you'll really be able to see the cross-hatching and the stuff we talked about much clearer. Uh, that's not a bad shot right there. But... Um, Anyway, that's going to be my contribution to the book, and then we'll figure out. I may still not. I, I may not have this book done because I don't know what I'm going to do for the book cover. Um, I might put a look back on there because I don't have to draw anything. I'm going to just lift it and stick it on there, and then if they make me change it, then I can uh, do the Frankenstein thing. Because it seems kind of dumb to just kind of do like part of Frankenstein that would just show around his hand. I don't know. I'm going to probably go back and forth on it for till the last minute. But anyway, hey, thanks for joining me. I hope you got something out of it um, rather than just boredom. But um, I haven't done a, a last second live stream in a long time. So it's kind of fun. Glad to kind of jump in and do this and do a little bit of artwork and um, hopefully uh, expand our, our minds and our horizons just a little bit. So anyway, I will uh, see you guys, well, Thursday for the professionals. I think I think Dan's hosting. Don't quote me on that. And then, of course, Sunday night with uh, Shelly. We'll do the show again, and um, hopefully we'll see you all there. Uh, if you have any interest, Wraith of God, the, the um, um, link is in the uh, description of the video. So if you haven't backed the campaign and you kind of want to see what it's all about, you can follow that link there to check it out. There's also T-shirts available now if you didn't know that. And uh, we'll, we'll have the shot glasses up sometime this week and possibly the beanies as well. So, um, uh, so there will be Wraith of God swag available. So anyway, again, thank you guys. Appreciate it so much. And uh, we will see you soon. Oh, Sequential Treasures. Promote Comic Art Convo. Uh, Comic Art Convo is a show I do with Sequential Treasures Saturday at 4 o'clock Pacific time. We'll be doing it this weekend. We do it once a month on the last Saturday of every month. And we just talk about original art. We share some original art out of our collection. Uh, we talk about a, any particular, uh, you know, a different subject every time uh, that's not necessarily comic book related. And then we tell con stories and then we show art and then we tune out. But anyway, it's kind of a fun little conversation and you get to see some uh, some cool stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's really sort of a, uh, a geek fest. So perfect for me and probably perfect for a lot of you. So join us. Uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday at four o'clock. So uh, thank you, Sequential, for reminding me. And uh, I will talk to you guys soon. Good night.